everybody. Yeah, this is Fantasy Lab. This is the show that we run here on Sundays where we talk about a homebrew, mainly for 5th edition D&D, but a lot of our stuff is kind of cross-compatible uh, with uh, with any tabletop role-playing game, sy- game system. At least the kind of thought process of it is. Um, you know, we're here because once you have unlocked the secrets of homebrew, you can do whatever you want with these games, and that's... Uh, that's probably the most freeing thing for any player or game master. So, yeah, Pete, what do we got on the docket today? What are we doing? Uh, mostly homework. <laughs> we got a lot of submissions this week. Uh, Sword, I see that you have submitted yours. Uh, Sword, this is the final time we're going to give it to you under the wire because I know that you're uh, trying to do it while dealing with a child. Uh, but tr- do get it in earlier than this uh, because we have to. Put yeah, we're together now. We we schedule our show well, I got based you on the like, wire. We schedule our show based on like what kind of content we get, what kind of response you guys get from your your uh do in terms of people doing the homework and whatnot. So please do try and get them in at least an hour before the show. Um just so that we have time to look at that and figure out what we can do and where. And we had a um, lot this week. Uh, you guys, yeah. I mean, I haven't looked at them yet, but just in quantity, you guys crushed this particular topic. It looks like uh, well, because I uh, love yeah, we this some topic. Of them. I, I think. I, I think. I think this topic. So, for those unaware, the topic for this week's homework assignment uh, was to create a seasonal magic item, kind of based around the kind of harvest season, right? All, all the fall and uh, all, all of that good stuff. Um, so I'm really excited to see what you guys came up with. Creating magic me items to me, Pete. And I don't know about you, but that was the very first thing that I, as a dungeon master, did that wasn't, um, like, in a book. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I Actually, sorry, I ran my own adventures, but... Well, yeah, yes, uh, but I think, actually, it might have been monsters for me. I, I mean, those two things, I don't know, those two things are kind of hand-in-hand. Uh, I... It actually took me a really long time to start using book monsters. Uh, like, if I needed a goblin, I would make a goblin rather than using a goblin for a long time, because I don't know why I did that. Uh, but, um, I was going to say, that's a bit weird, Pete. Yeah, I just didn't, I just didn't for a long time. I, I don't know. I think there was some part of me that was like, I don't want to use their goblin. I want my goblin to be my own. And then I looked at their goblin, and I was like, this is a really efficient goblin, and it's really all I will ever need. There's no reason to make my own goblin. Yeah. Well, unless um, you want an assassin goblin, see last week. Yes, un- you unless you need a, <laughs> uh, an assassin goblin. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, magic items are also on the list. I also like didn't even think of looking to the book for magic items for a long time as well, because I started playing with you and you homebrewed basically every magic item that was in that game. I was just like, oh, well, that's just what you do. Um, that's what I do. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I thought that, you know, there's there's that oral tradition of D and D which I love, which is you just kind of like. I feel like in a lot of ways, you just do the same things that are in the that games you that you yeah. first play in. Yeah. Well, and it's like, you know, <laughs> your goblin hunting prime end up like most of Okay, Frog, we'll make scarier mouth goblins for you next time. If you want, I mean, Frog, <laughs> I can just kill you, you know? Like, I can just make a goblin that's got a one shot. I thought that was a pretty close fight. But, um,. Yeah, well, the, I think the big reason magic items are such an easy first step for homebrewing is because, at least in 5th edition D&D, is because in this edition, more than any edition prior, there aren't that many magic items. Like, in 4th in edition, they came out with, like, four, three or four books just with magic items. It just had magic items. They had similar things in 3rd edition, and it keeps going back with just tons and tons of magic items. And in 5e, there's just a really small subset of them in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And there have been a few, right, that have been added in in Xanathar's Guide to everything and in Adventures, but really not, not a lot. Um, and so you have certain characters in your party, like let's say you have a monk in your party. There is not a damn magic item up until the Staff of Striking that's like a halfway fun magic item for a monk. <laughs> there's just nothing. All of the armor they can't use, all the weapons they can't use, the magic the, um, weapons they can't use. I wonder, if Tasha's, I wonder if Tasha's will have a couple of nice monk oh, items, like a I hand wrap, something. a hand wrap or something that they can just increase their punching power with. Yeah, well, and so is the dungeon master, right? That's exactly it, Pete. You're like, well, my, 
I, my players in my cube probably, they probably want a hand wrap that increases their punching power or something, right? Or maybe they can like whip the hand wrap, like whip it, you know, and do some cool stuff with it that way. Um, and that's the first step for Hell Homebrew. Every dungeon master gets to that point, and more often than not, you get to it pretty quick. When you're like, all right, cool, plus one sword, that'll be good for this player, and plus one bow, that's fine <laughs> for them, and shit. <laughs> mm, yeah. <my> mom. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, plus one quarter staff is really what it comes down to, but... Sure, but, but then you get into more complicated stuff, and it's like, all right, cool, the, the flame tongue sword for my fighter, and, oh, there aren't any really good magic yeah, bows, except most for of the, the oath staffs, bow. Most of the staffs then, are like, oh, I'm a monk well, using the staff, the, staff of the, the staff of the Archmage for its bonus to hit, hmm. <laughs> like... Huh. Yeah, exactly. It just gets to a point where you very quickly realize... Man, all these magic items are either stabs, wands, or swords. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of swords. Uh, I just, I wish there were just more. Give me more axes and hammers is really what I would like to see. Uh, but um, this is uh, aside the point. Before we go too much further into this, uh, let's just start looking at some of these magic items, Jeremy. You ready to hop in? Yeah. So, Pete, what, what exactly? Let's just start with yours because I want to say what oh. exactly was our our premise this year. Um, this year, um, this week, for the thing. We called it Autumn Items, but what did we what did we actually specifically ask for? Um, this week, we asked people to make items inspired by the harvest or just the season of autumn in general. Um, I kind of took a weird approach. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but some of the, uh, beyond that, just creating a, um, just creating a magic item for autumn, we wanted to give you a little bit more to think about. So we also asked a few simple questions for you guys to kind of answer about the magic items, which was the why, where, and how. You think about why the item was created, uh, where players would like encounter it in a game, and, and what would be an interesting scenario in which the players would like obtain that item, and then how your the item that you've created would create an engaging gameplay experience, how it would make something, you know, a unique story to tell. Yeah, exactly. Um... Yeah. And I, I think one of the things I really like about this piece that you, you added in was the where players will find it, because I think that's a really common falling, uh, failing for new dungeon masters, even very experienced dungeon masters. You go in, the players fight the big bad, and they're like, all right, we've killed the bad. And like, all right, you find, reads off list. Well, that, yep. There's no flavor to that. There's no cool dramatic flavor to how I just got this magic item that gives it a sense of mystique or uh, of ex of power or of anything. It just feels like another checkbox on a list of, of things I got. Um, and, and there are times yeah. where I think that that's fun. And yeah, if I could just divert for a second and give an advice, if you're going to do the list, if you want to do the, you just loot the horde and get the list, I very much like to not tell the players what the item is. Definitely don't write on the list if you're giving it to them in that way. Oh, you find, you know, you find a bag of holding. Just say, you find a bag, and then let them try and figure out that it's a bag of holding. Like, precisely. Uh, that's just a little extra detail if you want to go uh, in that way. But there's, as Jeremy was kind of alluding to, a lot more, like, interesting ways that you can introduce magic items as well. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the, my favorite examples that I've had in, in my games uh, is the, um, uh, gosh, I don't even remember what the magic sword did at this point. I think, if I remember correctly, it was a sword that could be, it was a plus one sword that could be used as a spell casting focus. That's all it was. And one of the players, they, they had, uh, they had, I, I rolled it randomly on a table and the players were battling an ogre. And so, they were like, "All right, well, you know, we'll, we'll we'll search we'll search this ogre. He might have something." And I'm like, "Yep, tucked up in his belly button. He's got this long sword. It's uh been it was clearly jammed in there sometime long ago, uh, and has been healed over." And they're like, "Oh, cool! I take this sword." And uh, one of the most the reason I like that is because the way that campaign that I say that campaign ended. The final battle of that campaign ended with our wizards yelling, I found this sword in an ogre's belly button! And <laughs> striking down the big demon. Uh, uh, that's it was very a, fun. a very fun little... It's just a fun way that, like, 
even something flavor like that is a cool tie tie back. Um, yeah, there's no uh, there's no amount of simple that you can make. Like you can just go really basic uh, and just you found it, you know, clutched in the hand of a body, like on the side of a dungeon, and that's more of a story than just you just find it, you know. So. Um, yeah, uh, yeah gonna hop I, in I totally and... agree with what Farron's saying, too. If it's a, a weapon that, like, a bad guy might be using, don't be afraid to let the bad guys use the weapons. That's another really good way to uh, make it feel like it's part of the world. It's weird, like, oh, weird, the Lich had, like, four potions of superior healing on them, but didn't use any of them. Huh. <laughs> True. Uh, oh, well, that's healing would uh, hurt the Lich. Well, oh, maybe you're right. Okay, so Lich <laughs> is a bad example. Like, oh, uh, no, that was why. He was like, oh, I had these when I was alive, but they were useless to me now that I'm dead. <laughs> I, I love the look. <laughs> I love the, the potion bandolier look. They're just worth so much money, I can't get rid of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, all right. Let me, uh, let me hop into my item yeah, here. Let, uh, let's talk about what you made. What did you make? Uh, a single item inspired by Autumn. I suspected that we'd get a lot of ones that were uh, very nature-based. Uh, because I think the first thing I thought of was changing seasons, falling leaves, uh, you know, harvests, Thanksgiving, cornucopias, stuff like that. So I thought of with another thing that I associated with autumn, which was back to school. Uh, oh, and I created, goodness. I created a syllabus uh, uh, as oh, my item, dear. which I intended as, um, in a lot of ways, I wanted it to be sort of like an instrument of the bards, but for a wizard. Um, and... Huh. Um, yeah, uh, the actual purpose of the item, the kind of lore of the item, is it's meant to kind of be a training tool for upstart wizards to kind of guide them in their education and their study. Uh, and in terms of where I imagine players would find it, I thought this would be a great thing to uh, either find, like, in the house. Like, I imagine they could very easily steal it from, like, an apprentice wizard. Or if there's a wizard that sees promise in, like, the party... This is a wizard-specific item, just to be clear. Um... If there was a wizard in the party that saw like promise in one of the players, I can also see this being something like, "Oh, take this. Uh, your your education has been completely sloppy up until this point. I want you to you know study from the basics here." Um, and um, I won't talk now about how it'll create a unique and engaging gameplay experience because I think some of that uh, I want to talk about after you know what the item actually does. Uh, so this is Sarum's syllabus. I chose the name Sarum because it sounded wizardy, but it's just a ah. it's just somebody's it's just somebody's some wizard syllabus. Uh, no, and, is Sarum uh, the teacher or the pupil? It is the teacher uh, in this case, uh, because he's handing out this well-worn mm. leather tome, which is imbued with magic power to help wizards in training learn basic spells. It contains instructions on how to cast the following spells. Uh, and I picked eight classics here. Burning Hands, mm. Detect Magic, Disguise Self, Mage Armor, Magic Missile, Shield, Sleep, and Thunder Wave. Whenever you complete a long rest, you may choose four spells from that list and choose an order for those four spells. You may cast each spell chosen in this way once in the chosen order without expending a spell slot. Once you cast a spell using this tome, you may not cast the next spell for one hour. Additionally, you may not choose spells in this way again until you have cast each spell chosen. Uh, so this was, you just at the beginning of each day, make a little curriculum for yourself out of the spells that you've studied. Uh, and uh, you kind of have these set like one hour class periods that I kind of have baked into the item because they don't want you to overdo it on your training. Um, and my favorite feature of this spell, and this is the kind of thing that brought it mm. together for me, which is whenever you cast a spell using this tome, make a DC 21 intelligence arcana check. And on a success, you can add that spell to your wizard spell book. Um, I love this, Pete. Thank you. This is very cool. I thought um, you were making like a joke at first when you said syllabus, but you know, I was thinking about it like, man, this is very neat. Yeah, thank you. I, I like this mechanic. Um, and it's kind of, uh, it's just meant to be like a thing to mentor training wizards. The idea being that the book has an inherent magic to supply the magic power while they're learning like the, how to actually cast the spell. Um, and um, Very cool. Well, thank I, I you. love it. Uh, in terms of like what I think is really engaging about this item, I really like that kind of, in terms of using this just mechanically throughout your day, I really like the idea of having to kind of plan out your day and create this mental map of when you think you'll need spells. Like if you have a general idea of what you're doing for the day, like, all right, well, we're going dungeon crawling. So odds are I'll need some detect magic. 
uh, at some point early on, but maybe if we encounter something, I'll, I'll make sure I have Magic Missile queued up next. And then, or if like Identify was on here, and then I'll need Identify last in the day after we've beaten the dungeon, you know, stuff like that. Um, mm. So um, that's what I think is fun about using this item is figuring out what your core schedule for the day is. And also just the high roll of getting new spells. Yeah, it's very cool. I I'm wondering, Pete, uh, you've marked this item as rare. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, is, is, did you think rare is really the, the appropriate one I, on this? I think you can make a case for uncommon, certainly. Um, I just thought, you know, four spell casts, four first level spell casts a day. I thought that was pretty good. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I, I, can also see, yeah. I can also see uncommon. Um, also, I think this is um, this template could be very easily changed to just insert which eight spells you want on yeah. here. Here, like I could see a mentor wizard has this book and gives it to like looks over the student spell book and goes, "Oh, you don't know these ones. You should know all of these important spells." And then just like runs his hand over the tome and it has the spells that you want them to have access to would be another thing that you could do with this. But yeah, that's yeah, my uh, that's my idea. I see V-Bunny and Frosty also both very much like this item. One question I have, Pete, is do you think that the, making the player choose the order is too complicated or could be too complicated? Um, that's a great question. Yeah, it could be. Um, I think whether or not I would include that detail would very mm -hmm. much depend on the type of player that I was dealing with. Uh, and I think that this is the format that I like the item in most personally, and I have a tendency mm. to just go with what I think is fun. But also, I think if this were published, if I was like submitting this to be published in the player's handbook or something like that, I would probably remove that aspect of it and just have it be, you know, you choose the four spells. Because I think a simpler version of it would be more publishable in that regard. But I very much like that order thing. I, uh, I also do. I'm also with you 100%. I think the the ability to learn the spell permanently is a very cool, um, a very cool addition. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's, uh, that's my guy. It's called Sauron Syllabus or, you know, whatever wizard, the, your wizard syllabus. I love it. All right. Well, Pete, thank you for sharing. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. I, I, I was happy oh, to be here. I broke everything. All right. Uh, our next item is, do we want to do mine next or want to jump to one of the, some of the uh, Whatever you're feeling. Do you want to, do you want to come back yeah. to yours later? Or do you want to do yours now? Might as well do mine, uh, whatever. Yeah, whatever. let's hop into it. I did a very, uh, what is this? Uh, sorry, I'm so uh, I did a very different take. Um, I created an object called the Cold Night Cloak. And the thing Maybe. that really inspired me uh, was the idea of it be getting darker sooner, right, and getting colder at night. Now, if you live on the su in the southern hemisphere, that doesn't relate to you at all. But for me, <laughs> of in grew up in the northeast of Mass of, uh, of the United States, up in Massachusetts, this was very much something I could relate to. As fall started to roll in, the nights got colder and darker much more quickly, and leaves kind of uh, would well were all over the ground. So my idea, why, and I was inspired very much by Mr. Sword Co. here, thank you, Sword, uh, for your fun little magic item stories. But that's what I, I was kind of inspired by here. I created a little story. Uh, crafted by a hag who had been spurned and left uninvited to the previous year's harvest festival, the Cold Might Cloak was created as a malefic trick for the unsuspecting miller, whose son had been complaining of the ever colder nightly treks to close up the old mill. This is why no monster, however fiendish, is left uninvited to these seasonal gatherings. Uh, Ooh, and, I like I like that. Uh, yeah, that was I mean, a fun little like. This is why Halloween festivals happen. You hit me right in my weak spot, which is a, a deep love of hags and witches. Uh, and then, uh, where will the players find it? Uh, I thought of two different ideas, but the one that really stuck with me, and this ties it back into the item: sodden in a puddle of ice cold water likely at an abandoned campsite, shack, mill house, or some other place of the like. Um, um, and then how will it create a unique and engaging gameplay experience? I like the idea of this kind of inverting the expectation of, oh, I got a cool magic item. And now you have to earn that magic item. You have to, uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. It's cursed. Um, um, yeah, I, I see the uh, the curse tag upon it, and I'm. Ex yeah. I also, Jeremy, I don't want to spoil it too much, but I do see a bolded monster in that. That's uh, that's very scary. 
It is scary, yeah. So this is the Cold Knight Cloak. I, I labeled it as rare, and it's a cloak requiring attunement. Um, my thought of making it rare was, well, at least now you got to be kind of higher level to get it, hopefully. <laughs> uh, the coarse woolen cloak feels like a warming embrace, even against the coldest winds. While you wear this cloak, you gain resistance to cold damage and have advantage on ability checks and saving throws made against the effects of strong winds, such as those created by the Gust of Wind spell. Um, and I know there are a few adventure modules. I know Curse of Strahd has some examples of this and Shield of Annihilation where you have to, well, where winds are actually a big environmental factor. And so I figured, well, this has direct application in some adventures and... And this is also spells. so appropriate for Curse of Strahd. Like, just flavor-wise, oh. this fits so nicely yeah. into the Curse of Strahd aesthetic. The curse. This cloak is cursed, a fact that is revealed only when an Identify spell is cast on the cloak. Attuning to the cloak curses you until you are targeted by the Remove Curse spell or similar magic, or until another creature attunes to the cloak. Removing the cloak fails to end the curse. So the idea is you could pass this on to some to some unsuspecting uh, person if you wanted. That's pretty uh, cool. And then at, yeah, at midnight during the full moon, a spirit of frigid vengeance, an apparition of a dead and frozen farmhand, appears and attacks you. The spirit uses the statistics of an avatar of death, Dungeon Master's Guide 164. That's the uh, avatar of death that shows up in the deck of many things. But deals cold damage instead of necrotic damage on its reaping side, and has immunity to cold damage instead of necrotic damage and has half the hit points of the cursed uh, creature. Boop. It appears in the space of the DM's choice, then 10 feet of you and attacks you, and the spirit fights until you die, or it drops to zero hit points. Whereupon it disappears, the curse lifts for you, and you become immune to this curse for one year. A creature slain by the spirit of frigid vengeance becomes a frozen statue until it thaws. Ooh. Uh, so wait, so... A creature slain by them becomes a frozen statue? Is that to say that... Okay, so they're still dead. They're just a frozen yeah. statue, and then, okay. I've used the text from there, uh, f from the uh, spell Cone of Cold, with the intention of a dungeon master. I've seen dungeon masters um, interpret this text as they're literally just an ice statue, and then they melt and die. I've also seen dungeon masters interpret it as like, oh, they're frozen, but they you can still heal them and bring them back, mm. right? And I wanted to leave that open-ended for a, a, a DM to decide. Um, because I, I think sure. that's okay a little bit with magic. Is that ability for another creature to attune to the cloak? Is that standard on the curse? No, no. Very few curses have that. And I love, I, I, almost that's, all of my curses do that. Yeah, I that's love pretty the idea cool. I don't know if I've of, seen that a lot. Of a player character getting a terrible curse and being like, oh my goodness, I need to get rid of this curse. And knowing if I doom some poor unsuspecting sap, I can get rid of it. Oh no, the moral conundrum! <laughs> Um, I, uh, I, I don't know. I think that's very cool. Uh, I like the, um, I like the story behind it. I like, mm. I would really want, I feel like some of this is going to be in the way that you use the cold night cloak in a game, but I really like the idea that whoever gets the cloak has some way of finding out about that little backstory of the cloak. Um, mm -hmm. so that they kind of understand like the frozen farmhand attacking you is like, the is the Miller's son, right? Yeah, yeah. is that character. Um, which, um, yeah, th this is one of those magic items that's like, as much as it is a magic item and you get the cool effect once you have, you know, Almost a little it, side adventure. Yeah, it's it's an adventure. Um, which, we are uh, the lion says... Oh, sorry. Sorry, Pete, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, um, no, please. Leo the lion was saying, I love that the curse isn't just beaten and that's it. It has ramifications for using it that can come back to haunt you. Yeah, exactly, right? You might beat the Avatar of Death once, but it'll come back in a year. It's and and I think that's a a fun like thing for the players to like think about as they continue to continue to use this item or not use this item, right? Because um, once you've beaten it, well, you've already beaten it, right? You might as well use it for a while. <laughs> but then, what do you do once it's done? You don't just sell it, right? Right? Presumably, I mean, unless you're of maybe not so good alignment, yeah. you know, you probably don't just sell it. At least um, neutral. <laughs> yeah, right. So I think I think that's very cool. And the idea, right, of like what you were saying, Pete, players wanting to find out about that story. I don't know. I think it'd be very cool for players to like hunt down, right, that uh, that hack, right, to maybe put the spirit to rest. That sounds like just a very cool 
adventure that, like, obviously it's not written anywhere in this magic item. Well, that's but the that's it's the something that the players might item. decide they want to do, and then the dungeon master's like, "Cool, all right, let's go for it." Right? Yeah, I think that's what makes this magic item great is that it has the um, it just opens up a story <laughs> that you can either choose to interact with. Uh, and when you're kind of forced to interact with at least a little bit in the form of an avatar of death, but either yeah. the players like just beat the avatar of death and go, cool, I got a cold resistant well, cloak for a while now, or, oh, you know, they read deeper into it. Also note about it, because I, it's actually interesting, the avatar of death, I made it deal with cold damage on its attacks and you're resistant to the cold. So at least like it's not as bad for you if you still have the cloak. But uh, yeah, Jin Hall was saying, oh, good <laughs> you know, before a party grabs the cloak and puts, and no one puts it on, and they give it to the first beggar they meet trying to do a good thing. Oh no! They'll never know. Odds are that that beggar died to a <laughs> avatar of death. Uh, so that is one small mercy. Yeah. So that was that was a cold night cloak. Um, Pete, what's our okay. what's our next one? Yeah, a we'll bunch of players two. submitted stuff now. Yep. Well, uh, I guess moving forward, we're community here. submitted. All community stuff. Uh, we got uh, one from uh, we got one from Grogan here, uh, which is called uh, Jack Spooky Lantern. Um, and uh, let me read the uh, the why, where, how on this one. Uh, so it was created for the purpose of frightening away uninvited guests and spirits when the borders between the realms are the thinnest. So on kind of holy and the well, your uh, your fantasy Halloweens and sort of your you know, spookier nights of the year. It's designed as kind of a ward against those things. Uh, where would players find it? Uh, in a field of similarly carved squashes, close to a witch's hut, or near a gathering hall in a village. Uh, all of those. I really like the feel of similarly carved squash. There's just a whole row <laughs> of of kind of oh, like one of them is magic squashes. And well, also, I really like the idea that one of them just has a aura about it and like telling that story mm. to the players of like but you see this one there's something yeah. up about this that's cool um and i agree uh, the how I, I think we go back to the how after we read the item here uh so we get mm. an idea uh do you want to take the yeah. item itself jeremy i'd love to i was gonna say i'd almost be offended if we didn't get at least one you know jack well, lantern I'll kind yeah. of vibe at some point so thank you Krogan. Yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs> Um, it's an uncommon uh, magic item, uh, labeled an adventuring gear, which makes sense. It's a lantern. Um, oh, yeah. I, uh, yeah, so each creature, unless invited into a 30-foot radius, must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or drop whatever it is holding and become frightened until it exits the area or passes a wisdom save. While frightened by this item, a creature must take the dash action to move away from the lantern as the safest available route on each of its turns, unless there is nowhere to move. If the creature ends its turn in a location where it doesn't have line of sight to the lantern, the creature can make a wisdom saving throw on a successful save. The frightened effect enters the creature. The lantern emits a dim, ghostly blue light in a 30-foot radius during the night. All right. I like the ghostly blue light. Very spoopy. Um, so I, I think, and maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding um, Grogan, but let, let me know uh, otherwise. I think the idea is that you, like, as an action, can use the lantern to do this, um, to, to scare people. My impression was that this is intended to be just a passive, always active sort of reward. Um, uh, and to read the how now, uh, Grogan was saying, I can see this item being used to create a maze of fear around a witch's hut by an NPC town or even carried by a party that wants a little bit more security when traveling. Uh, which, yes, this would definitely function in, the, in those particular ways and be a fun kind of tool for the players to like, oh, we got to fire up the spooky lantern to make sure we're, we're safe. Uh, one thing that I think, um, as it stands, even though I'm common... I suppose and, burning it does that, gotcha. Okay, uh, so it would need... I mean, I guess there's the I resource of yeah. lantern oil that would go along with that, but uh, one thing I think to consider consider about this is you might want to put an effect on it that makes someone who has succeeded against the lantern immune to the effects of the lantern because I think it would definitely get frustrating for a player to kind of always have you know anytime they're fighting at night I guess it would be uh in this case they just have this or you know just generally in the darkness they just have this aura of fear around them that would be really powerful um and uh, would essentially, like, you know, against a creature with a, a 
low wisdom save would essentially mean they would never get to get up into the fray, which is a lot of like big kind of bestial monsters and stuff like that. So I would definitely mm -hmm. give it the ability for them to become immune to it, so they're not making that save every turn. Yeah, and, and even beyond that, I see it looks like you took the mechanics from um, a turn effect for this dashing away until they can't see it. Um, usually, those turn effects have a, have a uh, kind of caveat on them that if the creature takes damage, that the effect ends for them. Um, without that caveat, this becomes game breakingly powerful. Really, uh, really this is a, a legendary magic item right here. Uh, uh, yeah, as, as it stands. Yeah. Uh, also, you probably would want to put a DC on the saving throw. But usually for uncommon, you're probably looking at like a DC of 13 or something. They're yeah, pretty common uh, DCs. It, 13 for uncommon, 15 for rare, 17 for very rare, and then, you know, when you get the legendary, it's weird. You kind of out the window, <laughs> but 19 is a good way to... Yeah. It's a good way to go. Uh, but, um, yeah, uh, I think it's cool. I like the... Uh, I, I do like the mental image of the uh, the blue flame and yeah, know, the player just kind of holding it out in front of them and, like, looking around... And then, like, you know, the wolf pouncing out of the woods and, like, coming into the blue light and then, like, backing off afraid. Like, that's a really cool uh, aesthetic for it. As it is as a uh, an enemy tool as well. A tool for, like, a witch. Yeah. Uh, all right. And so that is Jack's Spooky Lantern. Thank you, Grogan. Uh, again, I love the idea, like people were saying earlier, about it just being in a field of similarly carved squashes. And I wonder, just, though... This one's really scary. I also like the idea of the, the, the maze, right? The maze of fear. That's a very um, weird... It, I think it's like a cool, like, aesthetic like a, concept. Like I'm not puzzle. sure how it works mechanically, necessarily, though. I could see almost like a puzzle of, like, mm. you have them... It would be a very complicated... <laughs> uh, you'd need a map for it, but I could definitely see creating a literal maze where the players are trying to, like, walk through it. And you have to like judge the radius of the lanterns and like walk down a safe path uh, is is interesting. I could see this actually being a lot easier to do on roll twenty, where you can actually put the auras on things and and whatnot. But anyway, thank you, Grogan. Uh, we appreciate you submitting this. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Grogan. Um, Our next item comes from Nina Wang. Now uh, I know Nina. Nina, Nina was really wanted to be here. Uh, and I'm not sure yeah. currently. So we're going to come if back here. If you holler at us, and then we'll come back and, and do yours, uh, and otherwise we'll just, you know, do it last if you're watching the pod to catch back up. Yeah. But uh, let's hop on to uh, Frog next. All right. This is uh, an item by The Forgotten One uh, called The Feast Seeds of Baromets. All right, that immediately makes me think demons, but maybe it's not. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, there's kind of a write-up on the feast seeds at the end. Do you want to start with that? Yeah, let's start with the write-up. Baromets, the vegetable lamb stocks... I'm confused. The vegetable lamb stocks normally found in the... Okay, Baromets, the vegetable lamb stocks normally found in the farthest open plains of the Feywild are a kind of crop that produces a vegetable lamb, a sheep-like creature made of both meat and vegetable. Oh, oh goodness. Geez and produces both milk and honey from its udders. Very few places in the Feywild can grow and harvest these exotic plants, and even fewer have produced greater uh, baromets, a variant that grows rapidly and can feed a dozen or so individuals. It is said Fey merchants, who manage to get their hands on some seeds named feast seeds, have claimed they grow as quick in the material realm as it does in the Feywild. But the seeds never... But the seeds never fail to grow, as such, it is a popular item among nobles and wealthy adventurers alike. Okay, so it sounds like these are, uh, it, it sounds like these are kind of similar to uh, senzu beans, almost. You're very familiar with the senzu bean from um, Dragon Ball? I'm not. Uh, it is essentially just a single, like, bean that you eat, and it gives you all of your nourishment for, like, an entire day, and almost, like, revitalizes you in a way. Uh, which is gotcha. what I think of, at least, when I think of a feast seed. But we'll also just, let's see how these uh, play out. Uh, why don't I take the um, the actual mechanics here? Oh, uh, please, so I'm off. The feast seeds of Veramets. It's a very rare, wondrous item. Ooh, very rare. Uh, and they are consumable. A small pouch containing several enhanced seeds belonging to the Veramets crop, crop, also known as the vegetable lamb stock. The pouch contains 20 seeds. When one of these seeds are planted in untainted soft soil or earth, 
they grow in six hours to produce a stock of greater baromets. A single greater baromets produces two vegetable lambs, AC-10, HP-10, speed 30 feet, and when killed can produce enough meat, vegetables, and milk for a feast for up to 12 medium or smaller sized creatures. There's kind of a, there's kind of a meanness about this item uh, in that you grow the lambs and then kill them. Uh, but um, six large sized creatures or four huge or bigger sized creatures. Half as many if only one vegetable lamb is killed. The feast takes one hour to consume and becomes mundane food and drink at the end of that time, and the beneficial effects don't set in until this hour is over. A creature that partakes of this feast gains several benefits. The creature is cured of all diseases and poisons, has advantage on all saving throws against all poisons and diseases, and gains 2d10 temporary hit points, and gains the same number of hit points up to its maximum. The effects of the feast last for 24 hours. If the vegetable lamb is picked but not killed immediately, the benefits of grants are lost after 12 hours, and it dies after 24 hours. When you kill a vegetable lamb, roll 1d20. On a 20, you get a feast seed to add back into the pouch, but you cannot exceed 20 seeds. Um, so. This to... is very interesting. Yes. Uh, so there... I looked it up. Frog was saying the vegetable lamb of Tartarai, and I googled it, and it's, that's, a, that's a real thing. This is based oh, no. on some actual Central Asian um, kind of zoo mythology. I'm not familiar with this. Um, it's a, it's a, a sheep that grows out of the ground. I mean, that's all it is. It's a sheep plant. Huh. Uh, I'm looking at it now. How about that? Uh, no, I, I did not know this particular piece of mythology, which is probably why we were both a little bit, uh, Very we were both a little bit thrown by it. Um, but, um, okay, now, now that I understand, uh, let's, let's just talk mechanics, uh, let's just talk mechanics of this. Um, one thing I think is a good place to start is, um, I would rather than, like, creating the details for the, like, the AC and the HP and the speed of the lamb, I would just find a stat block that you can use i think there's a ram which would function mm. and so like planting one grows uh, a ram or actually i would even just say another thing just to to make this a little bit simple because I, I think the big takeaway that i would go with in this direction is it needs to get simplified down a little bit well, um along those lines pete this just is a very very complicated way of getting 20 versions of a hero's feast it's not yes. the same as a hero's feast because it, it is mostly about poisons instead of wisdom saving throws but it's got 10 pit points like a hero's it's just a different hero's feast yeah um and there's just a lot here for doing that you know yes. i think the the barrel mets make a very neat monster for sure it's a very strange take on a magic item uh I think V Bunny said it really well. It's kind of gamey, uh, and it, there's a lot of, of math involved in it. Um, something pretty uh, fitting for fourth edition or 3.5, uh, but maybe a little too complicated for 5e. And yeah, I would um, completely agree. Yeah. Um, uh, what I would. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying what I would recommend to just bring it down to speed is, I mean, for one thing, I think just use the hero's feast spell rather than explaining the mechanics of it. You can just reference gains the benefits as if they had consumed a hero's feast as per the hero's feast spell. Um, and I think rather than, you know, growing one of them uh, grow or growing two of them, just have each seed just grow one of them uh, and maybe like cut out some of the time. I don't know. There's just a lot of places where you could take out these variables, these extra details, I think, and, and tone mm -hmm. this down if you want to create that mythos of this creature in a magic item form that I think you could, you could pare this down to just get really efficiently get that across. A very cool use of mythology, Leo was saying, and I agree. I think incorporating this kind of bizarre, unique mythology into like the Feywild is a really effective right way. For it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A really effective way of both emphasizing that the Feywild's wild and giving this like really cool actual mythology a place in your your game um both very neat just uh it's just a, a lot going on here yep is i um, guess the takeaway 
Uh, indeed. Uh, but thank you very much for your submission, Frog. You've, you've taught me a new piece of mythology today, which is cool. We got learned. We got learned. All right. What are we on to now? We are going to be looking next at one from uh, Jin Hall here. Uh, and, ah. Uh, and um, we have the, uh, or it looks like two items here from Jin Hall, which we have the uh, the Wheel of Samhain and the Veil of Aus. Uh, I'll see. I apologize if I pronounced both of those terribly. Um, you probably, you probably. I'm, I'm sure I goofed it. Up. Oh, it says there's actually pronunciations for them in the precursor, uh, which is the uh, Sao In and Is Shi. Uh, so I was way off. Yeah, I was right. I did it bad. <laughs> um, but um, Jeremy, you want to read the precursor here? I love. Right? I know the homework said one item, but inspiration struck, so I did both. Yeah, I, ex I, I love that. I totally is okay, uh, Jin. Um, yeah, for there sure. are some times where in in the future we will only do one of them. We have time tonight, so we're, we're going to look at them both. But uh, in the future, if you do, this is for anyone actually, if you do make more than one homework entry, let us know which one is your favorite and you want us to look at the most. Um, just so that if we only have, you know, if we have a limited amount of time for some reason, we can, you know, focus on what's the most important to you. Let me look at the, which one we want to look at first, Pete. The, the Sam, Sam Hen? I'm sorry, Sao In? Sao In. Um, I can't pronounce it all. Yeah, why don't you take that one and then I'll take the bill. <clears throat> yeah. Ancient druids would spin this wheel, causing friction and sparks to light larger communal bonfires on the night of Sao In to pray and give sacrifice to the gods of honor and the dead. Oh, the gods of honor and the dead. No, honor the dead. It was honor in the dead, my brain. Uh, flames of the bonfire were also taken to light the hearths in people's homes to protect them from the coming winter. After many decades of use, the magic the druids casted, as well as a bit of the gods' magic, seemed seeped into the wheel, causing it to protect whoever used it. Once a day, you can spin the wheel to make a fire for your camp. And if you do, and if you make a sacrifice of some of your meal to the fire, it casts a druid's grove without needing for the spell's components. Pardon me? The spell lasts for 24 hours or until you put the fire out. Should you commit a crime or try to use weapons, your weapons for harm against anyone within the grove, the fire immediately expels you from the grove and you lose uh, all immunity to spell's effects for the rest of your life. Oh, Ooh. goodness. Additionally, you take 2d6 fire damage for angering the gods and dishonoring the dead. Oh, and this was... All right, about uh, this actual kind of holiday stuff here that um, you've uh, you cited here. Yes, um, uh, they mentioned that this is based on an ancient Celtic holiday of Samhain mm. and uh, and the ancient Fae of. Uh, oh, this explains the spelling. It's Gaelic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that uh, that tracks to me now, certainly. Uh, but um, yeah. Okay. So cool. Let's 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 talk about this wheel. Um, so for one thing, um, you had the kind of the question, you weren't sure what the item type and rarity would be of this. Um, you would call this a wondrous one. item. Basically anything that is not specifically like a sword or a ring or a staff or something that you can really obviously type out, uh, it's just blanketed under wondrous item. So this would fall in that category. And then the rarity on this, which is essentially one a day, a druid's grove, Jeremy, could you um, do you know off the top of your head what Druid's Grove does? I do. Uh, it allows you to choose a bunch of different effects uh, to occur. Some of them include walls of fog around the area to animate trees to defend the area. Um, there are a whole series of different options cause d a dense overgrowth uh, to occur that would be difficult terrain for creatures. Uh, it has a whole series of different effects. I'm actually very familiar with the spell. Um, um, so uh, a spell, I know that it's a very fairly high level spell, uh, and the ability to cast a spell like that every day is probably a pretty high rarity. Um, so at least rare, but maybe even into very rare for Druid's Grove? Well, it's funky, right? Because Druid's Grove, it, it t has a casting time of, I think, 10 minutes or something. It's, mm. kinda, it's not a, an in-combat spell. It's very much yeah. a... Yeah. It's like a, like a Magnificent Mansion, almost, but for Druids. Um, and also, this doesn't necessarily seem like it doesn't. This isn't an attunement mm -hmm. item as well, um, so that's why my instinct is that this yeah, is probably up. would be considered a very rare item. Uh, yeah, rare, very for, rare for somewhere a future grow uh, a day. But um, that's just a guideline. And, and 
the rarity on these Jin Hall, I mean, the, the more difficult thing is, is figuring out what the item does. The rarity is just semantics for how they kind of categorize them in the book. But that's, uh, that's around what we would say. Yeah, uh, I dig it. I think this is pretty cool. One of the things I really liked about this, and maybe there's a little bit of um, ambiguity that maybe should be clarified here, like commit a crime is a little, uh, a little ambiguous, but um, using weapons for harm, right? So like it's trying to attack other people. Very, very clear. And I like that this this magical item, although very powerful, right, has some. Uh, has a drawback to it. I'm wondering if, uh, for your intent, like, this seems like intent is a big part of this factor. And so maybe with the intent to harm, um, just for circumstances for like, let's say you got a barbarian in the party and you're all sitting around the campfire, you have your druid's grove, like, oh, I punch him on the shoulder. The like, gotten oh, kicked out, the druid grove. The druid's, you know? druid's grove's done. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a, a little funky if just, one of the players got kicked out of the room going like, well, this item is now... Fu it's not we funky. Can't use, it's only we can't use it anymore because it. The, the barbarian's not allowed in anymore. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's cool. It's very cool, that aspect of it. And I'm sure that ties a lot into the, uh, the Samhain um, holiday. But I'm just a little worried if we're too vague with the implications, right? Um, yeah, uh, I, uh, I agree, but overall, I think it's a very cool thing, and I, uh, again, an another thing I'd like to learn about is learn a little bit more about what sounds like a pretty cool, uh, ancient holiday here in Samhain. Uh, so, uh, thank you for sharing that one, but, uh, do you want to start the, uh, the Veil of Ishii? Uh, Ishii? Yeah, Pete, you want me Ishii? to take it? All right. <clears throat> uh, I, wa I, I want to do it. <laughs> I want to do it, Jeremy. All right, take it, Pete, take it away. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Made by the ancient <laughs> fae, the East Shi. Uh, this veil was constructed from the moss of the... Oh, I'm going to mess it up again. Uh, see? They called home and given as a gift to one of the original druids of Samhain to protect them during the night. While attuned to this item, you gain the following benefits. You gain a plus two to your charisma score, uh, not to exceed 20. Advantage on saves against being charmed and magic cannot put you to sleep. Fae cannot disdain your true nature. They either see you as one of their own or ignore you completely. Additionally, the veil has four charges. You can expend a charge for one of the effects below. It regains all charges at dawn. You can use a charge to cast Disguise Self at will. Um, you can use a charge to cast Charm Person at will. Um, uh, and then it's Fairy Fire at will or Speak with Animals at will. Um, so a uh, couple of instant thoughts here. Um, one thing, uh, the, the use of the phrase at will refers to, uh, yeah, refers the ability to, ability to just keep doing it as often as you want. Uh, so you would probably say, at will there. yeah, use a charge to cast the disguise self spell without expending a cell slot or whatever you want to, however you want to phrase it there, but at will would imply that you would just be able to keep doing it over and over again. Um, unless that is, uh, in some way the intent. Uh, and another uh, the other thing that I would say here is the uh, the idea of the Fae cannot discern your true nature. That is uh, a little bit vague. I I'm not 100% on what, um, you know, they either see you as one of their own or, or ignore you completely. Um, just a, um, maybe a way to phrase that would be like Fae perceive um, like your creature type as Fae just to like kind of codify that and kind of make me understand. And that seems like something that's really cool for a home game. If you put that on the yeah. item. I, I think there actually is some language about true nature in is this, the, in the game. Uh, that sounds familiar to me. Like that, that language. Um, uh, what is the spell that I'm thinking of? Are you thinking about like something involving shapeshifters? Because uh, when I think of true nature, I think, I mean, it's it's right on the border. Of yeah, true that might be where I remember it from. Um, well, and I think I think the intent, right, is to go with the disguise self spell that you have later. Um, so maybe, hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that the trick there is just going to be to uh, mm -hmm. find a way to, way to codify that a little bit more with mechanics. Uh, but on the whole, I mean, I think it's a really cool spell um, or a really cool magic item. Uh, I like the flavor. I very much I, agree. I like the tie to the uh, I like the tie to the Samhain again, which I would like to learn more about now. Uh, and um, 
you know, that's a, uh, that's a sign of a good item. If you're inspiring me to want to learn about this thing that you've created, which is really what dungeon mastering and storytelling in that way is all about. So. Absolutely. And, uh, I also, I mean, one of the things that I, I really, and this is an interesting one, the plus two to charisma score, not to exceed 20. Um, I don't know if that was an intentional design choice by you, but including something like that is a really interesting thing. Ability scores are really hard to um, increase in 5th edition Dungeons and & Dragons, and there are a few items out there that can increase your score above 20, um, but that's usually all the item does. So I, I really like that you have the not to exceed 20 uh, on there, just as a way of like, you're like, all right, I want this item to do a bunch of fun stuff, but I don't want this to be a legendary level item. Yeah. Um, it's pretty cool. Agreed. Uh, and in terms of the item type, again, this would probably just also be a wondrous item. Uh, and the rarity on this, um, uh, probably right on the threshold of very rare again. Um, mm. But uh, I... I don't know. I could see this as a rare item. That's what I was saying. I think it's on the threshold. Um, uh, I mean, what is it? Advantage on charm. Advantage on charm. Plus two cha. Uh, Faith and then Bay, two, and a couple and of more spell casts. I think it's. I, I, I don't know. I, I put this as rare personally. Not that it um, super it, it matters. Just, They're it guidelines. Just a, it's just that five e values ability score increases of any kind so highly is the reason why I'm yeah, giving I mean, it that buff. Either way, very cool item. Yeah. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very you. much for submitting your call. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Pete, uh, it's also pronounced she. Um, S-I-D-H-E. Also she. Oh. Uh, I, oh, I, I need to get in touch with my roots. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, the next one is going to be Ooh. from, or next two, actually, are from uh, Rex person thing. I've been, uh, I've been seeing Raventail hanging out. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we got the good berry pie first from Rex, which I'm excited about. Um, I'm also very, I could use some good berry pie. Yeah, I, I know it doesn't for look that. like I could use some good, so I was patting my engorged stomach. Uh, I could probably, I probably couldn't use any more good berry pie, but I want it. I was on that, uh, I was on that same vibe when I read it. Uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, so let's look at the uh, the why, where, how on this one. Uh, so why was the item created and for what purpose? Uh, what's better than fresh berries, fresh pie? <laughs> it's better than just the berries and a, a little better than just a healing uh, potion and it feels good to eat. I mean, yeah, that one you got for free. Why was it created? Why wouldn't this item be created? Yeah, really. Uh, uh, where will players uh, find it at a good bakery uh, hey. or inn or a lovely little old lady's house or a country fair anywhere where the food feels like home? Nothing like a good slice of pie to make you feel better. Um, which, obviously, you're listing places that would, like, serve pie, but I really like the asterisks on at a good bakery. Yeah. Uh, like, you, it isn't just, like, any bakery that you run into that you would find this pie. You would find it at, like, the legendary baker. Like, this pie is so good, it will heal your wounds. Um, which, uh, I don't know, I, I really like that extra bit of clarification on it, and I think that's a cool story too. And you know, you were saying how will it create a unique gameplay experience, right? Good berry is a classic, pie is a classic. Putting a classic twist on a classic spell. Just feels good and it probably tastes good. And I could not agree more. In the same way that Avatar the Last Airbender created this in crazy, ridiculous, fun world that people loved by saying lion, turtle, lion, turtle, bear, platypus, platypus bear. And people love that. Bear. That's exactly what you did here. Pies, good berry, good berry pie. Good, good berry pie. Uh, <laughs> and um, you were getting 2d6 plus 2 hit points when you consumed the choice of good berry pie. I'm good. sorry. I was just laughing at Rex's comment in chat. I've been to a bad bakery. They ain't going to have this. <laughs> uh or I wonder, it was just a pun on, was your choice of at a good bakery just because it's a good berry pie? Uh, a single slice of the sweet pie will provide enough nourishment to sustain a medium creature for one day and even leaves him feeling full. Call back to the good berry spell itself. Uh, the pie loses its potency if it is consumed after the pie cools completely. 
If the pie is reheated after cooling, you regain 1d6 plus 1 hit points, though the pie is no longer satisfying. Um, that's very... Uh, I, I like I that little that. extra addition. Um, and, um, I mean, I have no... Uh, I have no comments. It's it's all very efficiently put together, and uh, it's an absolute delight. I completely agree. Um, you know, if we were going to ruin that, prick, that last bit's too complicated for 5e, if it were going to be published in a book, but screw being published in a book, it's perfect just the way it is. Keep it. Alive. Yeah, ex ex exactly. Like, in the same way, I mean, if we were doing it for 5e, we'd take the word tastes wonderful with ice cream out of the flavor, the tooltip. Like, <laughs> yeah, of course, we won't. <laughs> but it is common and consumable. Uh, um, and uh, do you want to look at Rex's other item here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rex absolutely rocked it, by the way. Uh, please be gentle. It's my first homebrew item ever. Well, you, you nailed it. This next um, one, and I see that you made some beautiful yeah, I, art for it. You drew the art for it. That's really cool. I'll say, and this is something we talked about in the Discord a little bit, but in 5th edition D&D, it's actually open the Dungeon Master's Guide and go to any... I wish I had it right on me, but I actually do. Pete, what page are the magic items on? 214? Sounds right. I'm just trusting on you. To there are right. magic I'm items that, on I'm 214. I was right. I'm sorry, that's the beginning of the sentient magic items. You know, let's take an example. Winged boots. I don't know if he's showing up, Pete. Uh, you see that picture? Boots. Yeah. All right. All right. All the descriptions for winged boots is, while you wear these boots, you have a flying speed equal to your walking speed, and then a bunch of mechanics about the books, the boots. There's nothing describing that they have wings on the side. There's nothing describing the golden filigree and silver inlay and green inlay. There's nothing describing what they look like. And that's pretty much the same for almost every magic item in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Because in the Dungeon Master's Guide, they went the philosophy of let the art speak for the item. And... I think this already is telling me a whole bunch about what this item is. So I'm very excited. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And actually that is a good point. I, I'm, all, I'm uh, jealous. I wish that our items had our art that we visual, visualize in it. Uh, it's very cool that you could do that. And if you can make a good point in chat about the Goodberry pie, might want to say how many slices of Goodberry pie are in a Goodberry pie. I assumed eight, but I did Maybe as well. I have small slices. I don't know. Um, eight was my assumption. I, I just figured that whatever it was, it would be a. Um, it would just be like, well, if you don't slice enough of the pie, it's or not a six. slice of pie. I feel like there's kind of like a, <laughs> an obvious, an obvious fiat, you know. Oh, like, three. That's a big pie slice. Three point one oh, five. 3. One. Um. So uh, yeah, do you want to do the where why how where why how on this one, Jeremy? Yeah, so uh, this is called the Axer Rebrum, uh, a rubrum, uh, to have a melee weapon that can double as a ranged weapon without leaving your hand or an anything to retreat. That's why it was created. Where uh, people perhaps will find it, find it in the Feywilds, or as a gift from a druid, or deep in an ancient forest. Really like All that good one. reasons. Uh, and then how will it create an interesting experience? This is more or less a flavor weapon, although the function of a ranged weapon without projectiles or needing to be retrieved makes for a uniquely useful item. Also, the name is a pun on the Latin name for red maple, which is Acer rubra. Oh. oh. And it's an X. I, it, the, That's great. The book is also very much full of, of, of those little tidbits and, and notes. And I'll tell you, someone, well, I, I didn't get that, was lost on me and my, my lack of intellect. But someone will... will if, if this were published in, like, a thing, someone would get this item, they'd look at it, and they'd get the pun, and they would lose their shit. They'd just uh, very much appreciate it. So a very I, good I, friend I like of that. mine, a very good friend of mine is a landscape architect, and I just like walking around with him and pointing at trees and having him tell me the scientific names of them. You've made this item for my, my good friend, <laughs> uh, who would have uh, would have picked that a mile of way. My name is Rex, and I like trees. Um, Pete, take us away the, uh, on the actual on the yeah. actual business here. Uh, a rare battle axe requires attunement. Uh, is an axe hewn directly from the branch of a red maple. A magically enlarged leaf has been enchanted to create the blade. 
you gain a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls that you make with this weapon. As an action, you can make a ranged attack with this weapon using strength as your modifier, uh, the range of 20 over 60 feet. Uh, when doing so, the weapon does not leave your hand. The blade itself becomes the projectile, uh, dealing 1d8 slashing damage. A new leaf blade grows, regrows at the end of your turn. When you roll a 20 on an attack roll made with the weapon, it grants you the effects of the Barkskin spell. Oh, interesting. All right. Um, I really like the mechanic of swinging the axe and, like, hurling your bladed leaf off of it. Uh, especially because I, I really like the, um, uh, I, I really like the idea of you do, like, at higher levels when you're wielding this battle axe and you have multi-attacks, you can do, like, the one hit and then you know at the end of your turn you're not going to have a blade. Uh, after you do the th thing, so you do like the one hit, and then you throw the leaf in the distance, so it creates some very cool, I imagine, just like choices that you get to make in combat, where you're like dividing up your attacks in an interesting way, and it kind of like, I like items that force those kind of choices, so I like that design in, in that particular regard. Absolutely, and this is, I think, what I would kind of quantify or qualify as an enabling item, right? It allows a character to fight both in melee and in range. And that kind of, at first, seems like, oh, obviously that's what it does, right? But the effect that makes this item cool and unique doesn't make you more directly powerful. It makes you more versatile. And the thing about versatile items are versatile items make the game less frustrating for players without making them directly more powerful. It's a big issue that a lot of dungeon masters can have is they can just give lots of very powerful items to players and then they just swell to unreasonable power levels and the dungeon master doesn't know how to handle it. This is a very good example of an item that's cool to use, definitely powerful, but its power comes in its versatility. And I, I really like that. I think oh. just from a, and maybe that was an unintended design uh, intent, uh, design effect, but, but it, it it's works. there nonetheless. Yeah, it works. Yeah, um, very, very good uh and healthy design i uh also, I very much beautiful agree art. i love it yeah it's it's really cool uh the art that you drew for it uh, i picture just like very much like pokemon razor leaf coming off the top the spinning leaf flying yeah. enemies and stuff um and uh i also just love the red maple i have one in my yard at my house and it's a very beautiful tree um well that's... frosty thank you for helping of course and rex oh, yeah. Thanks, Thanks for being the ideas guy. <laughs> I'm just, I love Frosty stuff, too. Speaking of Frosty stuff, though, Pete, are, do you want to jump on to Frosty next? Uh, Frosty next? Yeah, or is uh, V-Money next? Frosty's uh, the second to next. <laughs> I think you mean second to last. Uh, second to next? I kind of like second to next. I've never said that before. <laughs> Um, v Bunny added us in the Discord. They didn't do the uh, the write up on the item, but they have one here, um, which is. Sure. Is this uh, cornucopia, Pete? Yeah, I do believe so. Uh, the why is the item was created for a harvest in a time of extreme drought, as the people still wanted to celebrate but did not have the moons, means to get their food normally. Uh, where would the players find the item? Uh, either given to them by the town once the party solved the issue, or it was found in the ruins of an ancient city. And uh, I like those two binaries of either it worked and solved the problem or it didn't, and now it's an ancient city. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, how will the item create engaging gameplay? Well, it's up to the player, you said. Um, all right, well, let's, uh, let's look at the uh, Cornucopia Feast here. Uh, and it says this is a... Th oh, do you want to do the item? I just did the, uh, the other stuff. Sure, Pete. I was going to let you take it away, but I'll, I'll roll with it. Cornucopia sure. Feast, an uncommon wondrous item. This is a fine cornucopia filled with various feasts. On your turn, you can use an action to cast Create Food and Water, drawing a feast from within the cornucopia. The type of feast you choose is dependent upon your luck. You can create acorns without requiring any sort of check, but you can attempt to create food and water adding a charisma check. If you're proficient with cooks utensils, add your bonus to the check. A failed check results in sour soup and squ a squalid meal. Oh, a meal created by the corner company can feed up to six people. Uh, it looks like some... you can just do this all the time. Okay. Um, and the feast types are acorn or maple based meal. No roll required. Oh, that's the squalid meal. Okay. Uh, pumpkin based or apple based meal. DC 10, bananas or sweet mashed shells based meal 13. 
Green bean casserole, 15. And turkey dinner, 8. A cornucopia of feast can be used up to three times over the course of a day. After that, the cornucopia can't be used again until the next dawn. Um, I like interesting. The, yeah, I like the simplicity of it. It just gives you three create food and waters a day, but with uh, a lot of extra flavor on it. Yeah. I think that the one thing that might be a little too much, there's a little too much text going on uh, after the, the type is dependent upon your luck. I think it's just a little too much, but I, you know, that's just my personal preference, I think. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm on the same page, I think. Um, in particularly, it's the, it's the cook utensils. Um, mm -hmm. And then, I mean, I think you can make it a charisma check. I don't personally fully understand your choice of the charisma check. This almost seems like it should just be, like, roll a d20. And, you know, on a roll, cause, because it's a luck-dependent yeah. thing and not necessarily a... Um, and, and specifically not a, a skill related thing or, or any kind of like willpower thing. Uh, but um, I, I you know it's again, personal preference, but um, yeah, I think it's cute. I like the different, <laughs> I like the different types of meal. I like your green bean casserole at 15. <laughs> it's very specific, which I enjoy. I love me some green bean casserole. The one thing I wouldn't, another thing I'd mentioned is like, uh, you said it can feed up to six people, which directly contradicts the create food and water. I think if you're going to reference the create food and water spell, then you probably want to stick with it. I mean, there's not That's a lot point. of wording in the Create Food and Water spell. Like, yeah, if you're going to change aspects of it, you might as well just, you know, write in those different effects. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, the Cornucopia Feast. Uh, wondrous item on common. Definitely yeah. exactly that. All right. I love how also the food you get doesn't make it any, like, there's no mechanical implication with it. It's just it's just, just different. Um, I don't know if this one was specifically related to the homework assignment, V Bunny, the chair of sitting here, but we can do it really quick. Uh, yeah, I don't, I think. yeah, I don't know if this is a, a homework autumn related item. Uh, this chair looks fairly ordinary, made of a fine wood, and can fit up to one person at a time. When a creature chooses to sit in the chair, they must expend and lose a hit die. Uh, they do not regain health for expending a hit die in this way, but if they sit in this chair for fit 10 minutes, they gain the benefits of a short rest. If they sit in this chair for one hour, they gain the benefits of a long rest. They must be sitting for the entire duration of time without interruptions. Any hit die lost this way do not return until the end of an eight-hour long rest. No, excep no exceptions. One not granted by the chair or abilities like trance. Um, so it's a uh, kind of a, a sped-up rest mechanic. Um, the only thing I would be concerned... I mean, uh, uh, very much this chair's power level depends on the nature in which you run games. Um, in, like, the way that Dungeons & Dragons wants you to run games, this would be unbelievably powerful. Uh, but I think in terms of the way people actually run games, um, it's maybe not quite as much so. Like, this would probably be it's a legendary one item. Person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I yeah. feel like just the intended, like, dungeon crawl mechanic of like you're doing like eight fights a day this would be mm. like the a legendary item according to you know the designers of 5e but about where it's at for most people you know so yeah know. and uh cool. yeah it's very gamey but you know in a lot of groups that's what they want so yeah that uh neat little neat little chair thank you very much b buddy that's the uh the chair sitting uh cool Let's look. Do next. we want to take our break now, or do we want to hit up these last? Uh, there are three: There's Sword, Frosties, and uh, Nina's. Um. Oh yes, uh, we're going back to Nina's. I, I'm down to I'm down to finish up these three, and then and then come. Yeah, back. and then we'll take our break. Yeah, I, I just realized we're 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 already past. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we had a lot today. Um, the, and then I know uh, Cherry has some stuff we can maybe talk about. Uh, Frosty uh, has the uh, the Harvest Samurai set. Um, and uh, the Harvest Samurai watches over rice paddies and their peasant, uh, peasant farmers during the autumn harvest. He protects them from bandits, ronin, and malicious spirits. Little is known of this man, but his presence always guarantees a peaceful harvest season. I like that you've built up kind of a character here that's, like, this isn't mm -hmm. just, this isn't a Harvest Samurai, this is the Harvest Samurai. Um, and the, uh, the why, where, how on these. Let me, uh, let me grab these two. Uh, these items were once property of the Harvest Samurai, a local folk hero of farmers and peasants. Each item was added to his lore amongst countless, countless legends meant to explain seemingly miraculous events. 
uh, where these items would be scattered and hidden around the lands in which the legend of the Harvest Samurai was born, and how these items should be gathered in a quest to help either an NPC or a PC to recreate the legend of the Harvest Samurai. Perhaps the local peasantry has been uh, scarred by a wandering spirit, and now this year's crops are at risk, so the party must recreate the legend in order to raise the morale of the locals enough to harvest the crops and then defeat or at least the wandering spirit. So you've, almost, you've kind of created a, uh, a quest line uh, for these items, which is cool. You have a whole story here. Uh, also, I believe the art credit on this is also to Rex, uh, and this looks amazing. Um, oh my uh, goodness, did you draw that, Rex? That I, is some very rad, very rad art. Yeah, I, I looked on it earlier this week because Frosty was like, oh, this was an art credit to, uh, to Rex Person thing uh, in chat. But yeah, incredible. Hype. Yeah, it's really, really, really cool. Always uh, nice to have art. Always nice. The Flute of Falling Leaves is the first of the three, uh, and it is the simple wooden f bam this. Try it again. The simple bamboo flute, Sakuhachi, I think is how it's pronounced, holds the power to enchant the fallen autumn leaves to dance upon the wind and shield its owner from harm. As an action, you may make a DC 10 performance check using the flute. On a success, colorful autumn leaves begin to dance and swirl around you, providing protection of half cover for the next minute. On a failure, nothing happens. All right. Pretty cool. That is a very cool item. I think rare is pretty much spot on. Yeah. It's kind of like a, a dancing shield, almost. Or not dancing shield, uh, animated shield. Um, but a, um, a very cool take on the animated shield. I, I mean, the, uh, the vibe of it. Um, this whole thing, I think, is tone and, like, the falling leaves coming around you. It's very autumn. You really did a good job of, of really crushing, like, the autumn vibe with that one. I agree. Uh, and I, I really like that it is a, uh, a flute, too. Like, I, I think the flute is definitely something that is often associated with, with uh, the samurai and that kind of um, Eastern um, kind of folklore. But I don't know. It's just very neat. It's something that a lot of people tend to forget in favor of the katana! Pete, you want to take the katana? I'd love to. Um, weapon katana, very rare, uh, requires attunement. This, this katana functions as a long sword with the finesse property. You gain a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls made with this magic weapon. I think I've heard that interpretation of a katana before, and it works very well. Just long sword with finesse. Yeah. Um, yeah, when, you, uh, when you roll a 20 on an attack roll with this weapon, a line of strong wind 30 feet long and 5 feet wide, erupts from the blade in the direction you attack. Each creature in the Path of Wind must succeed on a DC 14 strength saving throw, or be pushed 15 feet away from you in the direction following the line. The gale disperses gas or vapor, and it extinguishes candles, torches, and similar unprotected flames in the area. Um, Beautiful think, magic guy. Fucking love. Yeah, Very it's, it's incredible. I think you could drop the rarity on this. I think this could be considered rare, uh, as it stands. I think you because, could. Because it's just on a crit. Uh, if it was like a more controllable thing, then maybe not. But just the fact that it's, you know, when the crit happens. Uh, really cool. But if you wanted it to be very rare, for some reason, like you wanted all of these sets to be very rare or something, that would be fine too. Yes. Uh, um, and it looks like the other two are just, rare though. So. Uh, and you could even just like bump up the bonus too. You could just be like, oh, it's a plus two. Uh, and that would probably mm -hmm. get you close to that category as well. Um, very, but, very um, cool. Agreed. The, the thing that I like about that in particular is you've created this, this gale wind thing where it makes this, this line of wind. And I immediately thought back to the story, right? The little, the little blip that you gave this about um, fending off the wayward spirits. And like, that's part of the folklore now that if I were going to run this in my game, that's what the people would talk about, right? They'd talk about how the, the, uh, the samurai's great uh, sword... He, they swung the sword, and the gust of wind blew the wayward spirit, on, you know, onward. Right. That's uh, I like it a lot. Very cool. Um, the Oni of Wayward Souls is the final one here. It is a mask, uh, and it is a rare item that requires attunement. Um, the uh, as does the sword. I don't know if I mentioned that before, but the sword also did. Mm -hmm. uh, this traditional samurai mask protects its wearer from the otherworldly effects of ghosts and spirits. While wearing the Oni of Wayward Souls, you are immune to possession. You also gain advantage on wisdom saving throws against being frightened. Very crisp. Um, Andrew, I don't know if you need this to be an attunement item. Um, I think it's that, very, very cool, though. 
the um I think you could if you want it to be a tomb, I think you could maybe bump it down to uncommon because the possession is I don't know, it's just so powerful against creatures that use possession. It's so niche about... though. I, I like yeah, it. It's I, like it almost... as... I, I just there's so many like tiny tweaks that you could go, but I think as you have it, it's also completely fine. Um yeah. And um, I really like this too. I mean, you've created a really cool story here that I would like to be a player in the campaign that has these three items, you know, like where that's the story that you're trying to, to tell. I don't know. It's really cool. The whole, the whole like collection of them. Absolutely. And I think you, you nailed one of the most important things about it is you didn't take up a ton of time describing what the thing looked like because you got a beautiful picture down there for it. And even beyond that, you didn't take up a huge amount of space describing what it did. It was nice, simple, and clean. So important. Uh, simple and clean is the... Sorry, it's that from King of Hearts. It's from King of Hearts, right? King of Hearts. I was there, saying, there. that's just very good design philosophy. Absolutely. Uh, uh, this is, like I said, this is as crisp as the season you based it on, and I have no... I, I have a few comments because it's very well put together. Yeah, so let's... Pop over to our next one. Thank you again, Frosty Pirate, for the Yeah, thanks, Frosty. This one is by... Uh, which one did I open? Is this Swords? Cloak, right? Cloak of the Fallen? Yes, I think... Yes. All right, this is for Sword... This is from Sword Co. here. <laughs> so it's okay, Sword. Sometimes it's a little wordy. I was saying, when you're designing stuff for um, more general use you do typically want to keep it as concise as you can. That doesn't mean there aren't super wordy items in the book. Um, and honestly, this doesn't seem too bad. I don't know what you're talking about being too wordy. Um, Pete, you want me to start with this, or do you want you to take, take um, it? Yeah, why don't, you, why don't you kick us off, Jeremy? Cloak of the Fallen. Why? To symbolize life and the bounty it gives. Okay. Where it is most commonly found in locations where wood elves preside though other Elvish communities have been known to practice this custom as well. How? In many cultures, on, uh, a leaf on the great tree signifies a living soul. When a leaf falls in the great tree, it means the soul has passed and the fallen leaves nourish the land for a new budding leaf to grow. During the great harvest, the wood elves give thanks to the fallen and the new life they will bring by collecting colorful leaves and weaving them into cloaks. On the final night, a great feast is held, and everyone dances with their cloaks uh, like leaves blowing in the wind. When the dance ends, everyone falls to the ground as though they, uh, they are merely a pile of leaves to symbolize their final rest to be blown away by the wind. And thus the spirits of nature envy their cloaks with little magic to scatter the leaves in, in the air like a leaf storm and to carry the lost to the next life. The cloaks are commonly used throughout the fall to camouflage themselves during hunts and from predators, should one wearing the cloak ever be in danger, the wearer may use the magic to summon a leaf storm and obscure or distract their pursuer. With the magic gone and the leaves scattered, the person gives a final thanks to the fallen for giving them life. That's a nice right. story. Very cool little story. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I thought you were going to say more. I thought you were. I thought you were going to say more. That's why I. No, I stopped. Yeah, it, I think you told a lot about the, a, a culture of these wood elves um, that would be very helpful for a DM who wanted to, or who was interested in incorporating that kind of stuff. It's also an interesting consumable, but it seems like it has some other aspects. I'm gonna read it out now. So it's a common consumable item. A colorful cloak made entirely of fallen leaves woven into one another. Traditionally created and worn by wood elves during the great harvest to give thanks to those lost in the life they have yet to bring. While when worn, a player can use the magic imbued within the cape to cast a magical leaf storm to distract and deter your foes, allowing you to escape danger. Oh, and leaf storm is a spell. Interesting. It's got a range of 120 feet, uh, a effect range of 20 feet, 20 foot sphere, uh, and it lasts for one minute. While leaf storm is active, all creatures in the area affect have disadvantage on attack uh, and magic rolls, and the area is affected is considered rough terrain. The cloak disappears after the effect is used. All right. all right. So you do the dance and the leaves come off the... I mean, it all it all tracks the story that you've created. It's very clear how this Cloak of the mm -hmm. Fallen you know, ties into that. Um, a recommendation for design on this. Uh, one thing, I don't know if you want to make Leaf Storm a spell. Uh, I, I think that mm -hmm. you could cut down on 
some of the text at the beginning here. Um, and, you know, just like a colorful cloak made entirely uh, of fallen leaves woven into one another. While wearing this cloak, uh, the wearer can begin a dance that causes, and then, you know, all yeah. creatures within... Uh, an actual creature all, wearing this cloak yeah. can perform a dance and cause magical leaves to fill an area, you know, a 20-foot you know, radius sphere within 120 right. feet of themselves. Exactly. Um, yeah. You, you use the details there rather than kind of separating it into that aspect. And then once you have used this feature of the cloak, uh, you know, the, the cloak disappears uh, because mm -hmm. all the leaves are gone. So um, yeah. that's the way I would put this together uh, and, and just kind of simplify it a little bit. But overall, I think I like the uh, the direction you went. It probably would be considered an, um, I don't even know, would this actually be a common magic item? Because it's all creatures. It doesn't really help. I guess the fact that you can target it makes it a little bit more powerful. If it was just around you, I would almost say this is a common. But it might be uh, uncommon just because it's a a non-symmetric effect. I don't... Yeah, I, I think I think it is a, an uncommon item, but it's kind of hard to, to say. I mean, yeah, because cantrip spell scrolls are common. Level 1 spell scrolls are uncommon, and this feels like a level 1 spell. So this... Uh, or maybe, maybe even a level 2 spell, but probably a level 1 spell. Um... Feels kind of like a version of Sleet Storm, but uh, with um, which is a third level spell actually. Um, hmm. Well, but Sleet Storm makes it heavily obscured and does all sorts of other stuff. So, yeah. Anyway, I think yeah. uh, I thought it'd be easier to explain it like a spell. Um, yeah, it kind of. It's for it's, magic it's, items. It's usually better to just get it all in the block, unless yeah, you're referencing a, spell... a particular spell. If it doesn't already exist, right? Now, if you're creating this spell, and this is a spell that, like, druids of in, in this setting could use, right? Then you could reference the spell, and I think that's very reasonable. But you don't want to create a new spell just for the magic item. Yeah, and, and then you'd say, you know, once per day, you can shake the cloak and cast Leaf Storm, and then you would just, your players would know mm -hmm. what Leaf Storm is, because it was in your world. You could reference it like you would another spell. It's a cool spell, actually. I like the concept. Oh, yeah, I do, too. I think this would be a very neat spell for, like, for druids, like, legitimately. Um, and we're not talking about the merits of whether or not the spell is good or bad or anything. Oh, yeah. This, we're just saying... Spell, uh, I think the spell is the, good. Like, oh, yeah, the context of creating a spell for a magic item is, is where it gets a little confusing. Um, but thank you very much for, for sharing, Sword. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sword. Uh, and I think it's going to move us on to our last one tonight. I don't know if uh, I have not seen the movie. Yeah, I just yeah. I want to jump back really quick to this item, uh, to one of Jin's items, the veil, because Jin had a question in the chat. Um, how would I word it if I wanted non-casters to be able to use this item and the spell it has? I believe that you already have. Yep. So the interesting thing about this is nothing on this item requires you to be a spellcaster, right? Uh, I think, yeah, right here where you say, right, uh, it has four charges and can expend a charge for one of the effects below. I think what you could say is, um, additionally, the veil has four charges, uh, has four charges, period. As an action, you can expend one charge to cast one of the uh, spells uh, or one of the following spells uh, using the veil. And then you could list disguise self, charm person, fairy fire, and speak with yeah. animals. And then exactly. every game, all expended charges daily at dawn. That and would be the uh, the more efficient way of need. doing so. But um, even yeah, as it stands, only... you would technically still be able to mm -hmm. use it, even if you weren't a caster. Absolutely. Yeah. Nothing about this requires you to be a spellcaster. The only thing that would make that is if you said required assumement by a spellcaster. So that works just as is. Uh, oh, and there's a, uh, a good point from... Uh, V-Bunny, I don't know if that was what they were referencing. Hold on, the DC of the spells. Um, yeah, it's worth ah. noting that uh, there should be a save. You should mention what the save DC for the spells is if you want them to be used by non-caxters, and just make it like a flat line, like 13. is a good number to use. Um, but if you're going yeah, one of the things that a rarity. I might recommend, Nina, uh, is in or the... Um, yeah, in, in the the player's hand or the dungeon master's guide if you have access to it there is a staff called the staff of fire and in it it has a really concise paragraph this staff has 10 charges while holding you can action to expend one or more charges to cast following spells you and instead and that it says using your save dc you would say using a save dc of 13. 
Uh, and that's all you got to do. It's nice, concise, very easy to read. Or I think Wand of Magic, oh, no, Wand of Magic Missiles doesn't have it. Uh, Wand of Lightning Bolts is another one that would be really Magic good. Uh, no, I, I, I feel like yeah. Staff and Fire, Staff and Fire is the best way to go. Yeah. Um, because it has multiple different things that you can cast, which is similar to what you're doing. So. Yep. Um, Pete, what are we on next? We're, in, uh, we're on Nina's. We're on Nina's. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have not seen Nina, but we're going to hop into it now regardless. Um, Nina, hope you see it and hope this uh, this is helpful. Yeah. All right. Um, so do you want to... Yeah, take the why. Take the why where how. Yeah, this magic item was created uh, to capitalize on those rich enough to waste the gold on trinkets to bestow upon the owner a source of fall flavor at any given time. All right. Uh where will players find it? Typically, one of these little spoons uh, can be found in shops selling trinkets, or even in their favorite cafe, offering you to bring the taste of fall back home with you. Or perhaps you liberated one of these little gems from the drawer of some rich person's house. Finders, keepers. Um, uh, will using this item create a unique and game, uh, engaging game experience? Well, not game changing in any form. Having one of Nina's little spoons a fall flavor is a great conversation. <laughs> and if you're a fan of fall flavors, it's a must-have item. All right. So this, I'm immediately thinking, is probably going to be something like... Well, let's, let's just dive into it. I'm interested. Uh, yeah, so let me, uh, let me hop into the uh, mechanics here. Nina's Little Spoon of Fall Flavor, common to rare uh, and adventuring gear. Uh, people are unsure when these little knickknacks first started to show up in the markets, but once they did, they became a sought-after item by those who were addicted to what it had to offer. Pumpkin spice flavor whenever yep. you want it. That's exactly what I thought it was going to yeah, be. <laughs> there it is. Uh, the spoons of fall flavor come in three variants, wooden, silver, and gold. At their core, all variants are viewed with a specific use of the prestidigitation spell. The spoon becomes active when applied to a beverage of choice, typically coffee. Once active, it warms the liquid up to optimal temperature and infuses the drink with pumpkin spice flavoring. For those with deeper pockets, you can find the Silver Spoon, its rich pumpkin spice flavoring seeming borderline magical. Drinkers of a Silver Spoon infused beverage receive a plus one to persuasion checks as the magical flavor of fall tickles your taste buds. I like that <laughs> it's just a very nice, the magical flavor of fall tickles your taste buds. You had nice alliteration there. It was a delight to say that sentence. Uh, it, felt like a, it felt like an advertisement for the drinkers of the Silver Spoon infused beverage. Uh, and uh, for those with even deeper coffers still, there's the Golden Spoon. Bringing your drink to the absolute perfect temperature and infusing your drink with a flavorful experience that many consider otherworldly. Those who drink a Golden Spoon infused beverage receive a plus two to persuasion checks as your beverage supercharges you with the power of autumn, making you the pinnacle of basic. Like me. Like me, Pete. The pinnacle of basic. So... I love this. <laughs> this is great. It's delightful. It's, 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 it's a delight. Um, if I were to recommend a change, uh, yeah. it's a very minor, it's a formatting change. I know we hate formatting. I think, the, uh, I, think I had the same change in mind. Pete, you want to try to beat me to it then? I'm, I'm looking it up in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, were you going for the, the Viking horn? The Horn of Valhalla, yeah, exactly. Yeah, There's yeah. an item called <laughs> the Horn of Valhalla. It's in the Dungeon Master's Guide, and it also has different variants. And uh, it just shows a neat way of, of having the, the subheaders. I cannot seem to find it, which I am, you know, a little disappointed in. I couldn't just open right to it like I did previously. Um, let's just flip through. But uh, if you have access to Dungeon Master's Guide, uh, or, I mean, you might be able to just Google this online, honestly. Um, that would be how I would go about doing it. Yeah, so it has a general description at the top, and then it has a little table that says what, what happens with the different form. Yep. But um, very cool. It, that's just a, an easier way of, like, putting it together, but the effects are all reasonable. Um, they're very simple. Oh, yeah. Um, for a non-attunement, just plus two. To, I think common to rare is actually pretty reasonable for this. Just a, a permanent plus one to persuasion when you're drinking that... Uh, when, when you're yeah. drinking that chai or that pumpkin spice. Um, I know a lot of players that would love this. I so, do too. I, I know I a lot of absolutely has place I know in, a lot of memes that want this to just exist in real life. Uh, oh, it's, it's weird, like when I when I look at magic items 
And I'm like, oh, I could have a six sword that shoots wind out of it. That wasn't the one that I was like, I want to actually have this. The one that I wanted to actually <laughs> have was the one that, that like, one. oh, this one will flavor my coffee really well. <laughs> um, I don't know why I, I just, <laughs> the more realistic item, I guess, because I could just see this existing in the real world. Jeremy, can we like play have... cards right now? Just a spoon that like dissolves pumpkin spice when you stir your coffee with it? Yes. The problem uh, with Frosty's item, about it be if it were in real life, like take the flute for example. I have to make a DC ten performance check with a flute. That'll never happen. I I'll never probably get it done. I could probably hit that DC with like a week, with like a week of training. Well, I, thanks. I, I, I definitely could not get a natural twenty on a sword attack, though. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. The problem with. <laughs> 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 Anyway, Nina, uh, thank you very much for sharing. It was yeah, a very fun you. little item. Uh, I think this is another thing. If if we had had no items, just like with Grogan making the, the jack-o'-lantern, if we had had no items catering to pumpkin spice, I think this homework would have been a failure overall. So thank you for, for yeah. saving the day. Um, um, it, yeah, someone that, had to make the pumpkin spice. Pete, do we want to take a yeah, quick let's, break? Let's have a brief respite. All right, and then when we come back, we've got more good stuff to look at, so we will see you all shortly. <laughs> 